Right, I'll see you tonight, him. Okay, darling. Love you, too, cheers. Morning, folks. Just seen the dragon off. Morning, folks. So, morning, everyone. Hey, Robert, good morning. Linda, Stephen, morning, David. Morning, Stephen again, Lorraine, Derek, um, Caroline, Thomas, Lorraine, Nancy, morning, Nancy, Kevin, Anne, good morning, Anne, Hamish, Lorna, Ian, Stuart, Alex, John, Hugh, morning, Christina, morning, Lenny, morning, Neil, Karen, I think we'll cover next to these. Uh, morning Derek, happy birthday to you. Um, there you are Derek, good morning, happy birthday. Um, now, before we get the broadcast underway, because we're right up there, we're firing up the numbers, um, I was uh, contacted by Jimmy Tuffer, who asked me to turn the volume up, because when he's trying to listen in the night trunk down the road, he can't hear me apparently. Sorry Jimmy, that's as high as the volume goes. So just the way it is, I'm afraid. Um I maybe get I maybe dig the mic out and put the mic back in, see if that'll make any difference for you, Jimmy. Right, okay. Uh we say good morning folks. Sunday truck Davy out the truck and in the house at his home in Salisbury and his office. We are in North Lanarkshire, where it is a sort of cloudy eight degrees. Feeling like one, maybe zero because of 30 mile an hour gusts of wind. So that's your weather forecast for Salisbury, North Lanarkshire. You want to know what the weather's like where you are? Look out the bloody windy. All right, so we'll get this broadcast underway with the coronavirus update. Now, these are the figures for the 31st of the 1st, 2022. Tested in Scotland since the pandemic reached their shores. 4,181,457 individual Scots, and that was plus 1,662 new individual people um, tested. The total tests carried out was 18,608, but most of those people were repeat tests for their works. Okay. Tested positive since the pandemic reached their shores, 1,241,720 people in Scotland. All right, so... As I say, over a fifth of the population have had this disease. And that was plus 5,877 new cases. Now what we can say is that there'll be the PCR um, test uh, system being wound down. It's not quite sure how much it's out there. Alright. In hospital, there is 1,206 COVID patients, that's down 11, of which 33 are in the intensive care units, and that's up one. Vaccinated, 4 million 411,649 people in Scotland have had a single dose of the vaccine, an increase of only 659 people from Sunday to Monday. 92.2% of all eligible Scots have had a dose of the vaccine, alright? Now, 4,127,051 people in Scotland have had two doses of the vaccine, an increase of 2,505 people from Sunday to Monday. 86.3% of all eligible Scots have had two doses of the vaccine. Booster shots. All right, 3,295,501 people in Scotland have had three doses of the vaccine, an increase of 4,536 people from Sunday to Monday. 86, eh, sorry, 68.9% of all eligible Scots have had three doses of the vaccine. Deaths. I'm happy to report there were no additional deaths recorded from Sunday to Monday, so the daily figure of the hospital death rate stays at 10,311. Community and hospital deaths combined sits at 12,823. Okay, so there's still a fair bit of COVID kicking about, and we're not quite sure how much because they say the PCR test system's been wound down, 
everybody, I don't suppose everybody that takes a, a lateral flow test and test poly positive sends the results in. So it's very hard to say how much it's in the community. Okay. Right, moving on to review some of the news from Monday. Alright. Monday started in the rags with two main stories. The Queen Up After Storms, Malik and Storm Corey. Um, and the other story is the end of a uh, working from home. A uh, end of the end of the working from home order, okay. On the Queen Up from the two storm fronts that uh, blew through at the weekend, trees are doing everywhere, closing roads and railway uh, railway lines. Um, people's fences have been blown out, their bins have been battered down the streets and things like that. Trampolines have been gone flying again. So, big clean-up operation underway on Monday. And they, that affects the second story in the press, doesn't it? Because the end of, uh, what, the, the, end of the work from home order would have seen people taken to the roads yesterday to get back into the office. Why do you say the roads? Well, because we're on a, a reduced timetable on the rails and the bus services and the rail services will take a wee while to get battered back up to full capacity. All right. Anyway, we um, the Scottish Government wants a culture of change in the work environment, especially in office workers where if they can work from home then they should move to a hybrid type of working where there may be a couple of days a week in the office and three days a week at home or whatever. And we've spoken about this, it's a win-win um, for A, the employee and B, the environment. Okay, right, let's move on. Moving on, A. Eh? Monday saw the start of the free travel scheme for the under-22s here in Scotland, all right? Now, the scheme's a great thing which will save, especially young people under-22 and apprentices, a couple of going to college and university, things like that, a bloody fortune. It's a great thing. But, of course, there is the downside to it. The scheme's all applicable and open to everybody who are five. So, we Mrs McGlumfer and Mrs McGlumfer have got their tanks filled and their engines at the ready in case they've got to bar around Scotland hoovering up the kids who have all missed the last bus bloody aim. <laughs> so, you know, for all it's a bloody great scheme and the idea is to get kids to grow up using public transport so we can do away with uh, merc uh, people using a uh, uh, polluting cars and things like that. You know, the chances are that we Mrs McGlumfer and Jimmy McGlumfer are going to have to get in their motors because most cars, are, most families are two-car families now and whiz around the bloody country hoovering up the kids. <laughs> Jimmy Junior will be in Aberdeen and we Jenny will be in bloody Dumfries. <laughs> so, oh, hell's about to kick loose. It should be funny. Eh? Hey, fuel consumption's about to get through the bloody roof. <laughs> Let's hope the schemes limit the kids' eh, um, ability to travel around the actual nation too much. Okay. <laughs> so, eh, I see. <laughs> right. <laughs> um, so there you have it. Um, yesterday seen a, um, the end of the work to rules, COVID restrictions, so people will get back into the office. Um, town centres uh, will be pleased, especially those who run coffee shops and sandwich bars and things like that. And the, the free travel scheme for the nippers comes in, so that ought to be a bloody laugh. <laughs> Look out for newspaper stories in the next couple of weeks of parents running around the bloody country hoovering up their kids. <laughs> <coughs> right. And uh, moving on, Monday, Monday there's a new strain or sub-strain of uh, COVID apparently. And it's a named BA2. It's up to 33% more infectious than the original Cromer, uh, uh, Omicron strain. De uh, Danish experts say, all right. B2 evolved from the original B1 Omicron strain that is dominant in the UK. Now, the highly infectious COVID subvariant has quickly taken over in, Do in Denmark. Experts say it's more transmissible, but it doesn't seem to be any more dangerous than a. Uh, uh, Omicron Mark 1, okay. So the sub-variant of Omicron, as I say, is up to a third, a, a third more a, infectious than its ancestor strain. And BE2, which evolved from the original BE1 Omicron strain, that is currently dominant in the UK, has quickly taken over Scandinavian countries. And the study which analysed coronavirus infections in more than 8,500 Danish households between December and January also found that the BE2 um, a strain of Omicron 
uh, is more able to infect vaccinated people than the BA1 Omicron strain. All right. Now, worldwide, the BA1 so, uh, um, strain is uh, dominant at the moment, but the subvariant accounts for more than 98% of Omicron cases um, in Denmark, apparently. Okay. Now, the study was carried out by... Um, uh, one Frederick Pleasner, um, who is a, who was the lead author of the study, and it was a the research was carried out at the Stentis Serum Institute, Copenhagen University, and a Denmark uh, Denmark's Technical University. All right, so new strain, but apparently it's nothing to worry about, folks. All right, so that was in the news and. And Monday as well. But as we all know, the big story and the news on Monday was at 10 o'clock yesterday morning, Sue Gray's abbreviated report hit the carpet. All right. And then, of course, the whole bloody, um, the whole bloody media circus turns to it. So what's the, um, what's the upshot of the um, Sue Gray um, inquiry? Okay. Sue Gray set out on her findings, uh, her findings in seven sections and a 12-page uh, um, sub-report that she's put forward, all right? Uh, one section, uh, it says, against the back, uh, backdrop of, pan of the pandemic, when the government was asking citizens to accept far-reaching restrictions on their lives, some of the behaviour surrounding these gatherings is difficult to justify. So that mayor always says that there was parties, all right? But, uh, section 2, at least some of the gatherings in question represent a serious failure to observe not just the high standards expected of those working at the heart of government, but also the standards expected of the entire British population at the time. Basically, that says COVID rules were bloody well broken. All right. Um, uh, section 3, at times it seems there was too little thought given to what was happening across the country in consideration of the, appro uh, the appropriateness of some of these gatherings. The risks they presented to public health and how they might appear to the and how they might appear to the public wasn't taken into consideration. There were failures of leadership and judgment by different parts of Number Ten and the Cabinet Office at different times. All right, some of the events should not have been allowed to go uh, to take place, and other events should not have been allowed to develop as they did. All right, so that's the first three sections. And they're all bloody well damning. Now, the one about public health is actually quite interesting. Because if I was working in number 10 and I was in the end of these gatherings, I'd be looking at soon public, uh, uh, I'd be looking at soon number 10 in the cabinet office for recklessly endangering me at my work. So I would. Okay, but the other thing about the public health thing was, I mean... Bojo's had COVID a couple of times. He's inviting people from all over London into that bloody house for parties. And then they're getting back out into the community again. So large gatherings, as we know, were banned to prevent the spread of COVID and to protect public health. And here we have um, a number 10, not just endangering the wider public, also endangering the chances of the wider public following COVID restrictions, but they're actually endangering the staff that weren't they attending these bloody parties. Outrageous. Section 4. The excessive consumption of alcohol was not appropriate in a professional workplace at any time. Steps must be taken to ensure that every government department has a clear and robust policy in place covering the consumption of alcohol in the workplace. Well, we spoke about this before, folks. It would appear that they're all pushed down there at number 10. There was an environment of excessive drinking at number 10. So much for professional government. Everybody's sitting with a glass of wine at their table or getting pushed. Wow. Right, number five, section five covers the use of the garden at number 10 Downing Street. It should be primarily for the Prime Minister and the private residents of number 10 and number 11 Downing Street. During the pandemic, it was often used as an extension of a workplace as a more a COVID secure means of holding group meetings and ventilated space. 
This was the sensible measure, apparently, according to Sue Gray, and the staff appreciated it. But the garden was also used for gatherings without queer authorisation and a oversight. This was not appropriate. Any official access to the space, including for meetings, should be by invitation only and in controlled environments. In other words, there should be a record there. All right. So, basically what Sue says, what Sue Gray says is, it was all right for them to go into the garden to hold meetings because it's better. It would have been safer. Okay. Section 6. Some staff wanted to raise concerns about behaviours they witnessed at work, um, but felt they were unable to... Um, a, no member of staff should feel unable to report or challenge poor conduct where they witness it. There should be easier ways for staff to raise such concerns um, informally, uh, outside of the line of management chain. So basically they want a whistleblower's a, um, department at number 10. Um, and apparently the number of staff working at number 10 Downing Street has steadily increased in recent years um, in terms of size scale, range of responsibility, and it's more akin to a small government department than purely dedicated Prime Minister's offices. The structures that support the smooth operation of Downing Street, however, have not evolved sufficiently to meet the demands of this expansion. The leadership structures are fragmented and complicated, and this is sometimes led to boring of the lines of accountability. Too much responsibility, uh, or too much responsibility and expectation is placed on the senior uh, officials whose principal function is a uh, direct support of the Prime Minister. There's, this should be addressed as a matter of priority. So, that's a uh, Sue Gray's findings. Parties happened, and they're all pushed all the time. The Brighton Health and Safety at Work rules broke the Covid rules absolutely damning. Okay, so that's a basically where the press went, but there was a few other stories, right? So moving on Monday, down that road in, in the hey, Monday down that road and uh, the Tory government today you turn the man mandatory jabs for NHS employees. Savid Javid tells the Commons um a uh, the April a uh, deadline for uh, people getting jabbed is to be scrapped and the policy is likely to follow suit and being scrapped, all right? Now, this has pissed off the social care sector in England, okay? As up to 40,000 people had lost their jobs in England because, as care workers, they didn't want to be mandatorily jabbed. So, 40,000 uh, employees in social care down that road left their jobs because they didn't want to have to be mandatorily jabbed. The reason why they're you turn the new is up to 70,000 NHS staff across England. That's no more nurses and doctors and things like that. Remember, there's a lot of support staff. Don't want to be jabbed. So, um, they're going to do a U turn because they can't afford to lose 70,000 out of the workforce because some of them will be doctors, some of them will be nurses. You know what I mean? So, there's a U turn on that one. All right, moving on, Monday. Liz trust to introduce new legislation to allow the imposition of stricter um, sanctions on Russia if Putin invades the Ukraine. Now, it's been reported that the UK government intends to target London-based oligarchs that are friendly to Putin. But there's a Davy says here. Davy says, heard that! Right? This, com this crap comes after Biden had a go at Westminster for no cracking down on the dirty Russian money sloshing around London in the form of these oligarchs' fortunes. Because let's face it, most of these oligarchs are stolen from the Russian state. All right. Anyway, will there be stronger eh, um, sanctions on these oligarchs? I doubt it, because they're throwing great money, eh, great amounts of money at the, the Conservative Party. Right. Um, eh, will Putin invade the Ukraine? Um, probably no. There's more likely to be a regime change, a regime that's more friendly to, to Moscow than what it is to the West. That's more likely than um, Putin going on a full-scale um, invasion. But even if he does go on a full-scale invasion, I mean, these economic sanctions are talking about, Russia's been under economic sanctions for years, they don't give a shit. 
No, the West concentrated uh, uh, Russia, and Russia well, it just concentrates more on selling it to China. And it'll weaponize, of course, gas supplies to Europe. So the situation in, in the Ukraine is uh, deadlocked at this point in time. As I say, the only way I can see this um, a getting resolved is by a regime change which is much friendlier towards Moscow than it is towards the West. You know, if the Ukrainian people want to keep the integrity of what's left of their territory there. Remember, 2014, Putin annexed uh, Crimea. It's part of Ukraine. So, this is a brass neck for the West, and NATO especially. You know, Putin's just sitting there saying, I'm not doing nothing. You know. And we can lay the current situation at those in NATO have said that. And the, the lack of brains at the head in the hierarchy of the military and the diplomatic services back in the 90s when these new states were being formed, when we should have been telling these new states to form their own military bloc to protect themselves from Russia. And then NATO could have quit cooperating with that particular bloc without encompassing these countries into NATO. It was just bad diplomacy at the time. Right, moving on. Moving on, Monday afternoon, 3.30pm rolls out and PM Bojo the Clown makes a statement to the House on the Sue Gray report after Bojo, um, after Bojo commends the statement that he made to the House, um, he takes questions, none of which he bloody well answered. So Bojo takes a, Bojo gives a speech to the House and a half arsed apology. He tells the House that they're going to implement all the findings in the Sue Gray report, meaning that uh, there'll be a new permanent secretary to uh, number 10, who will run all the different departments, the way it used to be before Bojo got rid of them. Before Bojo and Dominic Cummins decided they were going to try and destroy the civil service from within. I don't know if you, you remember that saga. You know, um, that was Simon Case back then. So apparently a new permanent secretary has to be um, uh, put in place. Um, he controls on the amount of booze the buggers drinks to be put in place. You know, and a better change in structures of command have to be put in place at number 10. And all this is encompassed in Bojo's so-called groveling speech to the Commons. To the Commons. So after that, he takes questions, doesn't he? Um, first up was Starmer. Right? The Starmer has a right go at Bojo on, you know, these parties did take place. It's clear that you've misled the place. And he, you should go. All the way through what Starmer had to say, Bojo kept saying the same thing. Wait for the outcome of the police inquiry. Wait for the outcome of the police inquiry. Wait for the outcome of the police inquiry. And then when Starmer was getting to the end of his questions, um, he, Bojo went on the attack to say that Starmer had the, you know, when he was in public, when he was a uh, public prosecutor, he'd let Savile away and all that sort of shit. So Bojo went on a personal attack in Starmer, showing that he had lost the argument. All right, the next up was Theresa May, and Theresa May didn't half give Bojo up. Yeah, hey, she asked Bojo straight out, hey, you know, did you not understand the rules that you'd put in place stupid, or do you just think you're above the rules that you put in place stupid? You know, so Bojo didn't really have a retort to me. But I mean, if, if Luke could kill, that would have bloody well done it. You know, um, so Bojo mumbles a bit and says, wait till the outcome of the police inquiry. He stands by everything he's said and everything he's done. And then, of course, we have Mr Blackford next, haven't we? Well, Mr Blackford, he went on the attack. He read out the bloody charge sheet, didn't he? And at the end of reading out the charge sheet, he tells the House that Bojo had woefully lied and misled the House on the 8th of December. At that point, the Speaker jumps in, because you're not allowed to call the Prime Minister a liar, and you're not, about, uh, not allowed to say that he deliberately misled the House. What a bunch of balmy rules that is. Somebody needs to bring that bloody place up into the 21st century, to be honest with you. You know, bloody, <laughs> it's a bloody museum. Anyway, the Speaker tells Blackford to retract it, and Blackford says, no, 
when the speaker says the tractor, and Blackford says, that man over there lied to this house. So the speaker gets to say, gets down to the clerk and asks him to hold him up section 43 because he's about to kick Blackford out the commons for the rest of the day when Blackford gets half his arse and walked out himself. You know, so the newspaper headlines are full of Blackford booty doot to the commons, but he didn't get booty doot. And Bojo didn't have to reply. But what was interesting was he had to reply to Blackford's first question. And when Blackford was reading out the charge sheet, Boris Johnson was sitting laugh, uh, uh, shaking his head and laughing for his all to see. As if it was some sort of joke. It was all a joke. Wasn't it a fucking joke last January? February when we buried my father. When only immediate family could be there. My father was quite a prominent public uh, person in Glasgow. There's been two or three hundred people at his funeral. I think there was twenty years. Or socially distanced in the chapel. I think people quite realise how fucking angry the public are. I don't think Bojo takes it seriously at all. Watching that fucking debacle yesterday, pardon my French, really pissed me off. I nearly put my computer screen in a few times. When I thought you all the friends and family who to miss out on funerals, Sarah's dad's funeral, my dad's funeral, Bill's funeral, all these things that we all had to fucking miss out on while well, these spanners were partying. And I think people quite really don't think Bojo really understands the anger. Bojo was at his bombastic best at points when somebody got up his nose by pointing out where he'd tell lies. What was even sicker was there was only about six Tories that tore him a new one. One Tory MP for Suffolk drove to Kent to bury his grandmother and then turned round and drove straight back. There was only ten of them there. Ten at the funeral, and he turns and he says to Bojo, Do you think I'm a fool? But as I say, there was only about six of them ripped him a new arsehole. The rest of them were all starting up, trying to remember this guy's greatest hits. Obviously, they'd been put up to it. You know? But see, when we talk about the, the Bojo's greatest hits, you know, Brexit. What was the greatest hits they were reading out saying that Bojo had achieved? Bojo had achieved the. A hey, Brexit vaccine rule, high job vacancies, and the um, what else was that? But let's break them down, will we? Oh, I fastest growing economy in the G7. So let's break down Bojo's greatest hits, will we? Brexit, get Brexit done. Brexit's no done, especially the I protocols, and Brexit's been a fucking disaster, and it's a only oh, just properly hit. And it's being done in increment sector by sector. Brexit's nowhere near done. So Bojo hasn't achieved Brexit. Right, vaccine rollout. Now, why it did start well. But hey, didn't it take Europe to catch up and to overtake in the vaccine efforts, did it? No, it didn't. High job vacancies. You know, high job vacancies is down to the fact that we've got a workforce shortage. Freedom of movement means that we don't have enough people to work in certain sectors. Agriculture, food processing, drivers, well that's not a problem anyway, there's bugger all coming in. But the reason why there's so many job vacancies is there's not enough people out there to fill them in the right places where these jobs are. So unemployment's still quite high because Davy had a wee look today. The headline figure is between 4.3 and 4.5 percent of the working age population that's fit to work. That's 1.5 million people who have not got a bloody job. While Bojo is boasting about all the jobs that's been created. They haven't been created. Their jobs were left by people from Europe who were doing their jobs and buggered off because of Brexit. And the 1.5 million people who are looking for work, the jobs are they in their vicinities. That was another bollocks. 
and A. Number four, fastest growing economy in the G7. That's a flat out lie that keeps being bloody well repeated. The UK's a growth rate puts them five at number five out of seven. It's the fifth fastest grown economy in the G7. These facts are all there because we're search engines, we're bloody friend. Unbelievable that they think they can pull that push. Well, obviously they can with the English public. It would appear it's only up here we have something called a fucking search engine. Because apparently Bojo's due to the bounce in the polls. Cutting Labour's 10 points in half to 5. Wow. un believable So, for 116 minutes yesterday, that's how long the debate on um, Bojo's statement on um, a party gate went on. There was no contrition for Bojo. He wasn't sorry. And his Tory MPs should be bloody well ashamed of themselves. Ashamed of themselves. The man's a disgrace. And he should be gone. But that's not what transpired. Uh, and on the G7 thing at all, and the employment thing, as I stated last week, at the day, last Thursday, after Prime Minister's questions, uh, two weeks ago actually, Andrew Bowie, Governor of the Bank of England, expects unemployment to be the next big thing as the cost of living um, crisis uh, bites, um, causing the consumer to have less in their pockets, and the economy will contract as businesses go bust because nobody's got any dough to spend in them. You know, the wee Mrs. McGon from their carpet. All right. Right, moving on. Monday evening rolls around. And the... Oh, the to by the way, before we move on, um, the police, the Met Police thing, that's going to be a laugh. So it is. Uh, I wonder how long they'll drag that out for and what the conclusions will be. But what we do know is that the reason why the Mets hadn't um, been investigating this earlier was because complaints from people with MPs and members of the public going to the complaints body at the Met um, eh, to say, why the hell are you no handling this? Well, guess who as a eh, head of complaints at the Met? Baz Javid. Savid Javid's brother. Savid Javid, the health minister, member of Bojo's cabinet. And after the whitewash by the cops, any complaints made to the professional standards body that looks at professional standards in the Met, guess who runs that? Helen Ball. My partner in trees informed me up about this this morning to make sure I stick it in here so we all know what's going on. Helen Ball, as head of a um, professional standards at the Met, and guess who she is? She's Clarissa Dick, Dame the Clarissa Dick's partner. Civil partner, wife, girlfriend, whatever you want to call it. So there will be a bloody whitewash. I have no doubt about that. But any complaints about whitewash, well, there you go. We're hunting Savage Javis, brother, and it's Clarissa Dick's bird. There you go. Sorry, girlfriend or wife, or whatever, a partner, whatever designation you want to give. Um, the, anyway, let's move on. Monday evening rolls around at 18.30. Um, a, all Tory MPs meet to decide on Bojo's future. After the meeting, uh, Bojo survives, but a, he's had to make concessions to the, uh, the MPs. For a start, he's going to have to uh, get another report um, mere substantive report from Sue Gray and get it published. And he, he better, he's, he's going to lay out a plan on how he's going to fix operations in number 10. And he's got to stay edge execution till the police inquiry is done. 
So, the whole saga moves on into the police inquiry, you know. Um, they've got 500 page document that was submitted by Sue Gray and 300 photographs given to the mate as well. So it shouldn't be hard to prove who was where and what. The downside it is anybody that attended these parties that come forward to the Met the new and take a hundred pound ticket, they're not going to get named. So we won't know which public officials have uh, broke COVID rules and stuck their fingers up to us all. All right. But hey, uh, Bojo's survival um, uh, is, you know, it's a temporary stay of execution. I can't see him. I can't see him being able to survive. Either he's going to take the whole Tory party down with him or he's going to take the, or, or they're going to have to take him out. Because, as was pointed out in that the, um, the debate yesterday, Leopard doesn't change its spots. You know? Simple as that. Anyway, Bojo Survivor puts Dougie Ross in a bad position, I know, done it? A difficult position. And he sets the Scottish MSPs at odds with the Westminster party. Um, he draws his biggest problem will be Alistair Jack um, he, as he remains loyal to Bojo. Uh, what will Dross do and his MSPs? Nothing. They'll keep the bloody heat down and hope it all blows out. Um, I can't see any more than that, you know. Um, he, the other thing that Dross will be hoping is that Disney did it up. Damage the Scottish Party that much, eh, eh, or Disney the Scottish part, Party too much damage as we come up to the council elections in May. <coughs> <coughs> the First Minister here in Scotland says it's clear that eh, um, Boris Johnson misled Parliament and because of the, eh, um, eh, the, the ministerial code, he should be gone. Alright, and that's true enough. Right, uh, so, Monday evening as well, Sue Gray takes a pop at the Met for getting involved late in the game and preventing her from being able to produce uh, a, her full report to uh, the Prime Minister and by extension, if he didn't adopt it, which we know he would have, to the Parliament. So Sue Gray is desperate to get her full report out there, so don't be surprised if a leaked version of her full report makes it out in the, out the next couple of weeks. I think that might well be the next one. See, Sue Gray is a Tory party fixer. She's no loyal to anybody but the party. And I think Sue Gray's decided that Bojo needs to go. You know, because what did come out yesterday, and I've just read it to you, was bloody damning. Lack of leadership at number 10, culture of booze at number 10, now giving a flying fig at number 10 for the rules that they set out for the rest is, lack of ability to look after their own employees, putting their employees at risk with these large gatherings at number 10. As I say, health and safety at work should have been paramount in steady parties as these people leave number 10 and move back out into the communities that they live in. And vice versa, going in. So, absolutely damning. Damning. Um, will the uh, investigation be a stitch up? I reckon so. What they're doing now is point for time to get this to blow over so they can make one uh, some issue bigger than it. At this point in time, they're trying to push out Ukraine as being a bigger issue. It's no. The biggest issue at this point in time is Partygate, and below that, in people's minds, would be the cost of living crisis that's coming around the corner as we're about to get whacked with a £700 rise in our energy prices as we're about to get hit with tax increases, as inflation continues to surge. So, you know, party gate is the number one thing in people's perceptions, and now Bojo and the Tory party are now playing for time, and uh, the press will very quickly move on, because let's face it, they're all bloody Tory-owned and all. 
talking about the press. Let's move on to this morning and what the papers have to say because time's getting on. I'm here in the 45 minutes. So let's move on to this morning and what the papers have to say. I'll get it up on the screen, it'll be easier. Alright, Scotland's paper, PM pleas for job after damning parties report. Alright, the Scotsman goes with the most damning conclusion possible. Failure of leadership in Downing Street. Excessive drinking behaviour, difficult to justify. Little thought to what was happening across the country. Staff felt unable to raise concerns. Right, the eye has PM pleas for his job. Failure of leadership over Downing Street parties. The Herald has PM at bay as report damns failures of number 10 leadership. Um, the Metro has a failure of leadership. As you can see there's a pattern here folks. The Times has police, uh, police investigate PM's four lockdown parties. Here's the ones that took part um, a, a, that were partnered in his flat apparently and his birthday party. Alright. Um, and the, the National has kicked out for telling the truth about a liar. Blackford a forced to exit comments for true remarks about Johnson. Partial findings of Grey Partygate report revealed. The police investigate Prime Minister. Alright. The Daily Telegraph has PM to ask Grey for new report. That's what we were talking about after the 1830 meeting in the Conservative Party last night. And Ukraine call with Putin delayed as Macron gets in first. That's not what happened. What happened was Bojo was scheduled um, call with Putin yesterday. He had to be put on hold as he went to the parliament to try and justify his bloody law breaking. The Scottish Daily Fell has. Sue Gray's party probe has 500 pages of evidence and 300 photographs after an interview and served 70 witnesses. But she released just 12 pages. That raises more questions than answers, leaving Britain in limbo. That's why we demand now publish the whole damn thing, meaning the, grey, the, the Paul Gray report. The loony rag, the express, comes down on the side of Boris and says, you got it wrong, now put it right. The Daily Record has, PM under fire over Partygate report, man with no shame. Cocky Johnson savaged by MPs after pathetic apology, apology as cops probed 12 lockdown bashes, one in his own flat. The Sun has, don't know, I'm going to look, <laughs> I just scroll by it. <laughs> the Daily Star has number 10 party probe, 50 shades of grey, and it's got a, um, a picture of Bojo and a cell with bondage gear on, alright? And uh, what it says is, uh, on the front page, Fifty Shades of Grey, Bojo takes a spanking in brutal report. He's accused of lack of leadership, humiliated as cops probe 300 party picks, and he gets kicked in the nuts from former PM. <laughs> ah, the star's right up there the day. It's no way, it's no pulling any punches, is it? Bojo gets a kick in the nuts from former PM. <laughs> Ah, that's better for the star. I like if you laugh for the star. And all the other papers here in Scotland go away, go away the very same thing. Courier, man without shame. Glasgow Times, PM is a man without shame. And it's all the way through the local papers as well. You know. So that's what I've got for you today, folks. Um, uh, I hope you found it interesting. I hope you found it entertaining. Um, there was wee other snippets of news out there, but they were hard to ferret out. After the, the, the Grey Report had the tables in the, in the press centres yesterday, the whole media uh, um, circus swung onto the Grey Report. You know? <coughs> so, that's what I've got for you today. As I say, I hope you found it entertaining, I hope you found it informative. And uh, it's nice to see the viewing figures so high as well. So let's say, uh, let's get to the usual stuff where you just start bailing out quick as hell. Remember, folks, divided movements do not win their causes. So when it comes to the cause for Scottish independence, put party politics to one side and keep your eyes on the prize and learn you how you're going is. How you're going to do borders, how you're going to do currency, how you're going to do international deal. All that stuff, all right. And as I keep telling you, the answer to that is, has always been 
How does anybody else bloody well do it? We're not stupid, we've got a highly educated population. We'll copy and paste the best practices from around the world. Council elections coming up. Get your party's perspectives out to the public on that. You can go to town with each other on that. But when it comes to the question of independence, partisan politics in your pockets. Okay, let's move on. Support the independent media folks. Support Broadcast in Scotland, support Independence Live, support Indie Live Radio, support Caledon Media, not as a crack we show there. Support Truth Radio, support the AI Scott magazine, and support independent bloggers and bloggers. Okay, and if they've got a crowdfunder on the go and you can throw a few shekels in the pot, please do. All right, health messaging. Face coverings are still mandatory in Scotland and enclosed public spaces, all right. Clean hands and surfaces regularly. Social distancing, folks. When it comes to social distancing, um, think about the people who are in a boogie. All right. And hey, get a test. Lateral flow tests are still free at the moment, although it looks like Bojo's going to start charging 30 quid a pop for them in July. So that's what I've got for you today, folks. Have a nice day. I look forward to speaking to you all tomorrow. Um, on a Bojo's visit to the Ukraine because they've decided the best thing to do with Bojo at this point in time is get him to feck out everybody's eye line. Have a nice day.